yes, we can help people too because we really do. I think people understand the importance of what architecture brings to the world. Business of Architecture, episode 421. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that empowers you to do your best work more often. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps firm owners like you structure your practice and your teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a place in your career or your practice where you felt that you aren't where you're supposed to be? You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. I certainly have. I remember when I was in full-time employment contemplating starting my own architectural practice. It was the fear and the risk that kept me from pulling the trigger. And yet listening to our fears keeps us small and it keeps the world from getting the gift that we could otherwise give it. And ignored, what I found is that this feeling grows over time until we make a choice. Architect Ibrahim Greenwich came to this place in his career where he recognized that he needed to make a shift. Greenwich is the founder of Bolt Architecture, a Brooklyn-based architectural practice. In 2017, Greenwich was appointed to serve as president of the New York Coalition of Black Architects. He's a winner of the 2015 Jermaine Stewart Recognition Award, and his designs have been featured in the United Nations Remembering Slavery exhibit and the Center for Architecture's Say It Loud Distinguished Black Designers of the New York Coalition of Black Architects. In 2017, Greenwich was appointed to serve as president of the New York Coalition of Black Architects. A winner of the 2015 Jermaine Stewart Recognition Award, his designs have been featured in the United Nations Remembering Slavery exhibit and the Center for Architecture's Say It Loud, Distinguished Black Designers of the New York Coalition of Black Architects. In 2017, Greenwich was also acknowledged among the top 20 Distinguished Minority Architects and Designers by Architizer. In today's episode, you'll discover how Greenwich started his practice and grew it to a team of five. You'll also discover what his number one challenge is running his practice today, as well as the top three principles that have been his guiding stars for success. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Ibrahim, welcome to the business of architecture. Hello. Tell me, what has been the number one challenge for you in building up an architectural practice? Given today's conversation, um, working capital. Uh, you know, we're in a profession that is uh, cash flow rich, uh, requires a lot of upfront use of your own use of cash to pay employees, to pay consultants, to pay designers, to pay whoever it is that, that encapsulates the picture that we, you know, and creates the product that we work in. Um, you know, having cash available is usually um, one of the short-sighted parts of the business. Um, getting access to that cash is also difficult. Um, you know, you have to, you know, as a business owner, um, you know, walking into a bank, it's different today than it was before the pandemic, I think. Um, even different than it was 10 years ago, you know, where a lot of us had relationships with the people in our bank today, everything is, you know, I don't go in the bank for much these days, um, because if you deposit your check virtually, you know, clients pay you with a credit card or, or, or a debit card or a bank transfer. Um, so, you know, the interaction with the bank, which I think is important for a small business like myself, um, is very limited. Um, and when you walk into these banks, regardless of the size, um, the, the, tellers or the individuals who are hired to assist you um, are now even further limited at what they provide because that job has been outsourced to someone else who may work remotely. Um, so, you know, I think in today's world, we've, you know, we've lost, um, you know, the, the nature of one-on-one -on -one and having personal relationships. 
Um, it's the nature of internet and the nature of the world that we're living in. Um, and given that uh, as a as a go in between or as an issue right now, um, it's difficult for a small business like myself to say, "Hey, I need working capital." Um, you know, I've had been in business for um, now. You know, I've been in business for myself for well over ten years um, with Bold Architecture. It's been in corporation for six years. Um, we've been in profit for every year except for 2020 during the global shutdown. And it's sometimes it's difficult, um, you know, managing multiple hats to figure out what does that look like. You know, I'm a first time business owner in my entire family. Uh, so it's what is a, what do those questions look like for an individual like me who seeks working capital or seeks a line of credit? Um, what should you look for? What should you not do? Um, you know, so I lean on um, lawyers and financial consultants and planners and individuals in my in my group or in my tribe who assist me in providing me with the feedback that I need and put me in contact with certain people. Um, but it's still difficult. What are some of the impacts that you find that you're experiencing because of the difficulty of getting working capital? Oh, the easiest thing is right now is uh, my personal credit's affected. Uh, you know, so I leverage the use of a, um, rather than a corporate line of credit, it's a personal line of credit with a business name on it. And, um, you know, that affects your credit rating because it's, it's, you know, business purchases that are on your, your personal credit. Um, and once upon a time, it was fine. But when, you, you know, you get to a firm of five and, you know, you got to buy a laptop and you got to buy 3D scanners and you got to buy software. Um, the purchases on $200 or $300 anymore, you're talking thousands at a time. Um, you know, and sometimes it's a situation where clients um, are... It's you know it's not personal that they didn't pay you the day they said there was you know they have children or they're on their way home or they're in transit or they got five things that they're working on or they're overwhelmed at work um, you know sometimes they need space and bandwidth to also transfer funds from their account to another account to be able to pay you and all these other things that you know unbeknownst or unaware on your side um, so you know you, you you're patient and you know it's it's one of those professions where you work first pay later. And um, it's a model that I've strived to figure out ways to um, have it work better. Uh, I think lawyers have got it down to a science, you know, where you pick up the phone, this call's being recorded and billed at a rate of X, Y, Z. And they're letting you know it costs, you know, that call, that phone call, 30 minute phone call was X hundreds of dollars. And you, you, what are you going to say? Um, you know, so it's not that I'm charging clients for phone calls, but it's, understanding the nuances in the business where it's um, telling people, look, you have five meetings with me before I have to charge you. Um, now that you put a quantity to it versus what I've been taught, which is you, you, this is just, you meet with the client till it's done. No, we, not, to, not today. You know, I meet clients sometimes, they no, I want to make sure that the tubs align on the first and second floor. And it's like, that's not going to change your budget, but okay, we'll give you what you need. And it's another design meeting or, you know, it's trying to get them to the finish line on getting um, estimates from contractors. And it's, you know, it's understanding their, their, their uh, limitations. Some clients I have are elderly. Um, they're not readily available to jump on a Zoom call or to make a purchase on a credit card or bank transfer. They rather mail you the check <laughs> and or come in person and meet with you and have a different type of meeting. And, you know, it, it's, it's fine. Um, but these things in today's world where things are moving at a, at a much, much faster pace than they were 25 to 30 years ago, you know, with BIM modeling and, you know, people working from home and everything is in the cloud and everything is, you know, transitioning from my office. It was a couple of years ago, transitioning to a server where now we have access to the entire office database, you know, so how do we quickly get those documents into the server so that we all have it? Um, all of these things sort of create rhythms and create sequences and operations um, that I had to learn and work for myself and help and craft um, strategies that work for me and work well for the business and work well for the team. Some people work better at night. Some people work better in the morning. Some people prefer to get in early and go home a little earlier. Um, so, you know, the pandemic really did sharpen um, a lot of those methods and methodologies that I've sort of created um, so that I can now work with a team that gets larger. What do you find it is right now that's having the demand for the cash flow that's causing you to look for outside funding? Is it bringing on new team members? Is that you're growing? Is it that it's difficulty collecting from clients and making sure that those invoices come in on time? What do you think is at the root of the cash flow issues that you're having that are so common to running a small architectural practice? 
Well, we're growing. Um, and with the growth, um, you know, the projects get larger, the requirements become more. Um, you know, we're scheduled to start. Uh, we had a kickoff meeting right before this for um, the office's largest contract to date. Um, and it's a huge um, project that um, I personally am working on, you know, not getting stuck in or stepping on my own toes or, you know, getting in my head and thinking, oh, we, this is this is a lot. Can we handle this? And it's like, no, we, we, this is what we wanted. This is what we signed up for. This is it. So it's like, do we have the tools? So, for instance, I need a camera, a Matterport camera, which, you know, and we know in this industry is a, a 3D scanning computer. It's, it's, you know, the guy's like, I can cut $200 off the price if you purchase it right now. And I'm like, great. I got to find $3,500 to buy this camera because I need it within two weeks. Um, on a contract that's our largest, but, you know, as I was sharing with my team, you know, I may not see that money for six months because it's a city contract. So I got to pay the entire team to go do surveys, to complete drawings for several weeks until, you know, the city of New York and the, and the powers that be, um, the trickle down are able to sort of make that bank transfer because it's not, they're not writing a check. They're just going to go online and click transfer and the money's going to be in my account within 24 hours. Um, but you know, it's sort of, these are the things that are really the cast intensive or cast intense, um, portions of the business that, um, we learn about, uh, what, you know, how do you create systems? How do you, and at the same time, manage this new contract while managing all the other projects that you have? Um, do I have to bring, bring on a new person? I'm sure I will. Um, and now I have to start looking out for what that person, who that person is, how am I going to pay them? Because again, um, this is capital that the business will see, but it won't be till October or December of this year. I'm glad you brought that up, Ibrahim, because here's one of the challenges of growing an architectural practice is they're so cash hungry. Because if you think about it, like you said, the typical model of doing the work and getting paid for the work, if you're growing in terms of that you're getting larger projects, you're getting larger project sizes, depending on how you charge your fees and invoice, what can end up happening is you're doing a whole lot of work for a larger project, meaning you have to bring on additional people. You're having to bring on additional tools, like you said, a camera that you had to buy that's an additional expense. And so you're not revved up to delivering at that level. But if you're working with cities, these traditional procurement processes, it could be 30 days, 60 days, even 90 days before you see that money. That creates a huge pressure on the business. Absolutely. So what have you been your strategies to be able to deal with the growth and the cash flow shortages that are common, so common in architectural practice? Great question. I think it's um, reminding my team, you know, one of our company values is integrity. Um, so it's checking in constantly with the team about, you know, not micromanaging, giving them the bandwidth, saying, how long do you need to create X? Okay, great. You say Wednesday? I'm going to give myself till Thursday um, and just creating realistic schedules and structures um, that work for all of us. You know, it's, you know, clients, I had a phone call with a client today who said, what's taking so long? And I had to let her know, look, the proposal says six to eight weeks. We're only at four weeks. You know, it's, I understand you're anxious. Um, but as long as you're in a space of where you're speaking from integrity, they have no choice but to relax. You know, it's, if, I told you six to eight weeks, we're at week four, and you're upset that the drawings aren't ready. <laughs> we're not at that deadline. And understanding and communicating with them, look, this is a process. It's a product that we want to make sure is works and it's cohesive and um, that uh, the contractors, when they bid on these documents or look at these documents, um, can get their questions answered without necessarily having to reach out to me for several other questions. Um, and then just reiterating to them, you know, education is the other value that we had in sharing with them, look, this is a marathon. It's renovating a home that you live in is not a is not a race. You know, there's. I understand you want to be in your house by December and then sitting with the Christmas tree and the hot chocolate and saying, "Yes, I did that." And I had to break a bubble and tell her, "No, that's not going to happen. You're going to be. You started the project um, without a, with without approved plans and without a plan in place in all reality. Um, so I'm sorry you feel as if your walls are open and you know, there's holes in your ceiling, um, but I told you not to. <laughs> and she's got to realize that, you know, you, you did. And, you know, here we are now at the fourth week and your anxiety is getting the best of you. And I told her, focus on other things like the roof 
or the exterior of your building or who's the masonry contractor. And uh, I basically sort of gave her something to do. Um, but being that integrity is a value. Um, I, sp- I, I tend to speak from a very, very powerful position because there's really nothing for me to beat around the bush with clients or anyone about. Um, so when my team says to me they need five days and I tell the client seven, um, that includes my own personal time to be able to get on it. Um, and it allows me to relax. So I'm not pressed for these constant fire deadlines there are situations where clients can't wait and there are fires and i express that to the team and i let them know look this may require some overtime of of it and it's you know and it's a give and take um you know it's i don't want my team to feel as if i take advantage of them because um you know we're working together um so i offer availability to them where it is all right i know you're going to put some hours in heavy on monday chill on friday afternoon or take off next monday or whatever it is to sort of make make up for the extra time that you're giving me. Um, and I think that goes a long way with my team because, you know, they get it. You know, they, they understand that, you know, there are vacation and there are points in this business where you have to put the pedal to the metal. And then there are points where you can kind of coast for a little bit. Um, and with that understanding, um, you know, with the coaching and um, and the teaching, because this is, you know, where, when we're at these positions, we have to teach some of these young individuals and this young talent about, what the industry has to offer because they don't know what they don't know and what they don't know you can't be angry at them for it um so you know communication has been important and then the the power of the realization of integrity letting them know to share with me if you can't meet that deadline look you need two more days you need five days or you got to take your mom to the doctor i get it but just communicate that to me so we're not putting all this unneeded stress on you and making your performance and the product that you create worse Um, so that we can go through those checks, uh, checks and balances within the office. So that's been the the most powerful thing, I think, that allows me to sort of strategize and keep pushing forward. It's just, you know, open communication and keeping my word, the power of my word. And for you, what has been the most challenging part of leading team members? Learning what each group sort of needs. Um, You know, it's, I've, I've, Senior level people, you know, members, people who are, I guess, from the from the from the education of drawing with hand, with pencils and pens and on paper, um, they need less coaching than the students and people who are fresh out of college, for instance. Um, understanding what each person sort of needs and being able to give it to them and allow them to move with some power and some some tenacity um, has been difficult. So it's. You know, what are your capabilities? What is it that you don't like to do? Because there's things that some people will not do because they don't like to do it. Like spec writing, for instance. I hate doing specs. I hate them. Does but... anyone love doing specs? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yes. I mean, I know a few people who are like, yes, I'll do specs. And I'm like, great. You need to come on board. I, I got some specs for you to write. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that I would give to some of my junior architects because they're not really in that space of understanding yet how, what specs mean, how to impact the project, what specifications do we incorporate, um, even if it's in the drawings. And sort of making that connection between the virtual and the physical is difficult for them at this point. Um, so, you know, just giving people what their superpower is, so to speak, and allowing them to sort of run with it, um, that's been my difficult piece. What would you say has been the biggest change from running a practice with one employee versus running a practice with five employees? The frequency at which you check in. Um, mm-hmm. Again, everybody works in different. Yeah, tell me about that. Sort of. So I've had to learn different te- methods. So it's group text. Is it an email? Is it on Teams meetings or Zoom meetings every two days? Um, these are the things that I've learned. You know, you've got to have a, a, a strategy for, you know, just because they may have a problem with something and they haven't shared it because they forgot. Um, they were shy. They didn't know how to express whatever it is that they had to. They didn't realize those are problems, so they spent two days doing something in circles that they didn't realize they could have had an answer to within just a quick answer. Um, so it's like just checking in with them. You know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, those are usually the days that I'm on site visits, and I find my time checking in with them. Um, so if there's a strategy for it, I let them know. Thursdays are the days that usually I check in in the mornings before lunch. And, you know, we have our little powwows and meetings, and we discuss what's going on with this project. Keep a working list, reminding them and coaching them. Keep a list, write these things down. Because again, you know, it's a different generation of how, you know, we work. You know, I'm still not paper and pen. I'm sort of changed to the iPad. I think similar to you where I'm writing my notes on an iPad. 
which is still paper and pen based, but it's now it's like a digital version of it. So you got a record of it. Um, but it's like teaching them some of these tricks. Um, some individual who are mid-level, they have some strategies, but they too have some things that they sort of figure out what works for them. They have different requirements. So sometimes uh, checking in with them is better in the afternoons and the evenings when they've sort of done a lot of the other things that they have to do with a minutiae of the day. Um, so, you know, it's like those sorts of things have been really, really um, part of learning. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, it's working with a partner. You know, it's um, as a, having a business partner, we're friends. Um, but in reality, it's like I tell people all the time, it's like a marriage. You know, there are things that we both have, we, we both have to agree on for things to happen. Um, and then there's a science, um, you know, my partner joined um, me a few years later after me. And during that time, I had sort of four or five year jump head start on sort of running a business. Um, I understood a lot of different things and the nuances. I had um, equipment that I sort of came with versus him. He was sort of coming in cold, trying to figure out, you know, who's going to be his database of clients. How is he going to sort of get these clients? What type of product does he want sort of want? Um, how is he going to sort of brand himself in the world? Um, these are things that um, I knew before um, because, you know, it was five years sort of solo. Um, but then when we sort of merged those two um, ethos, uh, you know, he's going to have to figure out what he sort of wants to do. You know, it's, uh, he does his own projects. He has his own mythologies. Um, and then sort of my projects are, are their own sort of, ecosystem within the office and then we do have pinups and we do have time that we share and we share it with each other um but yeah he's sort of works at his own pace and his own team and that's what's best for him you know everybody works differently uh, tell me about the partnership how does it work do you divide responsibilities uh, do you both bring in the projects and do your own projects how do you have the studio mm -hmm. split up what works well for you guys so yeah, we both bring in our own projects. Um, we a lot of Google Docs sharing, calendars, a lot of those sorts of things. Um, and we both share responsibilities. I'm primarily marketing. He does a lot of the technical aspects of the business, you know, making sure that the insurance is done. Um, you know, we both meet with the accountants. Um, but most of the most of the day to day operations is, is you know my primary responsibility, the bills, um, the you know the funding, the projects, etc. Um, but he does bring in his own projects and he has his own team um, that works with his projects. And, um, you know, they have their own meetings and he has his own methodologies. Um, but, yeah, we, we meet. Um, we also meet uh, usually once a week or twice a week, depending on if he's in the office or if I'm available. Um, but we definitely make it important to at least have a conversation um, once a week to discuss, you know, bills, um, projects, staffing, um, anything that's related to the business that may need to sort of get someone's attention. He may have an issue with the code review or something that he may want to share with me, um, research, um, or just, you know, just have you experienced this before or have you experienced this before or how you been? We haven't spoken any week. Everything's good. How's the family? How are the kids, etc. cetera. Um, that's sort of how we've been, um, been doing it. And it's, it's good that we're friends before. That makes things a lot easier because we know how to, how each other operates and, you know, how um, sort of what both of us brings to the table. And from the financial side, is it a shared pool of money where then you pay yourselves a certain amount and you take distributions yep. in a traditional sense? How do you handle the finances? Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's a shared pool. It's a, you know, a business account and we share it and we share responsibilities on the bills um, and, you know, dist distributions and paying payroll and everything else. Well, how, how did this great idea come about? Because you've done what so many architects want to do, so few are able to do, which is actually launch a small architectural <laughs> practice, something that actually has a mission and a purpose. Take us back. Take us back. How did this start? One of the reasons why I opted to have a partner is, and I, you'll laugh, is um, so for a long time, you know, architecture is collaborative, you know, and I was by myself sitting in this entire office before it was renovated and we had conference room space and we had monitors and everybody had dual screens. It was just me and a MacBook computer. And I was like, it's lunchtime. And I hated going to lunch by myself. Uh, it was early on in the business. And I was like, this is not fun. You know, I don't, I don't get to talk to anyone. I had just come from working at a firm that was a medium sized firm. And um, at the time, um, during the last 
housing recession. Um, I was one of the employees who survived um, the huge amount of layoffs that happened during that time period. And um, I guess that was a good fortune to the type of projects that I took on and the, the bandwidth that I was sort of able to sort of carry. And I was managing sometimes 25 to 30 projects within my office, project manager, project architect. And for an uh, operation standpoint, from a senior level, you're like, that guy's great. He can do all of these projects. We need to keep him. I was doing drafting. I was doing invoicing. I was doing specs. I was doing site visits. I was like, I was a one-man show. And they knew that. So they kept me as long as they can. And um, the sort of final blow came when the firm decided that the schools that I was working in and the primarily education sector had dried, had, that pool of money had dried, that basically dried up. Um, they didn't get renewed for a contract and they decided that they were going to focus their efforts on designing prisons. And I had no interest in designing prisons. And I had to make a decision for myself whether it was going to be designing prisons that were unethical, um, were not what I wanted to sort of be spending my creative time and what my talents were to be doing, or you know, reinvigorate the practice that I started, a little drafting firm at that time. Um, mm. I was doing a lot of, uh, you know, I had a pool of architects who were called, who I met through different, all sorts of different pools of, of avenues, and they would call me for, we need you to draft, or we need you to survey, or we need you to do these design drawings, or we need you to do CDs. And I was pretty busy for a period of time just doing that. And um, I realized that, um, I had to make a decision whether I could take that full time or continue doing work that I was not in, not not inspired by, um, saw no joy in, and saw no creative freedom in doing. And um, I took two visits to two prisons, and the reality of it is, I saw nothing but black and brown faces in these jails. And I decided I would not be a part of the system. And I quit my job and basically decided I need to get my exams done. Um, it took me two years to sit down and take the exams. My wife supported me through that process, as amazing as she was. We had no children at the time. I went to the library every day. I spent nine hours a day in the library studying, and um, I got my license. And once I got my license, it was the, the sky was the limit. Um, I got scared, like most entrepreneurs do. They don't want to tell you this. We all get scared. There are moments of fear. And um, I, I, I stopped doing what I wanted to do, and I got a job. And the irony is I got a job at a great design firm doing work that was previously would have been dream work, you know, working on the Hancock Tower and designing interior space, or office space for, um, uh, what's the soap company? I forgot the name. HBO, for instance. And um, watching how they did business versus what I learned through years of experience was not something that I, I liked. Um, you know, when someone tells you we don't have quality assurance checks, we have insurance as a solution for that. Was it, was I understood as someone who was just in the process of taking exams was a big red flag. And, um, I didn't want to sort of be a part of that and I quit. And, um, from there it was like, all right, you know, you have to believe in yourself if this is something you want to do. Um, and I just started having, the faith and the belief in my own skills and the, the ability to talk to people and the ability to have conversations um, became um, natural. Uh, you know, it was just fluent and later my phone kept ringing and the rest is history. It's been 10 years since then and um, I haven't looked back. That's a beautiful story. Ibrahim, and it can't be understated that one of the most difficult things to do as practice owners, as business owners today, is believe in ourselves. And it sounds, it sounds silly when we say it in a certain degree, but if you've ever been there, you know what Ibrahim and I are talking about here. And what I'd like to know is, you quit twice. Now, when, when you... <laughs> You, I did. I didn't yeah. realize until you said it. I quit that one, but twice. Yeah, yes, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so when you took when you took that first leap, you had a little drafting business on the side. Was that now? That's way in the past. But was that a clandestine uh, moonlighting thing, or was the employer aware of that? Because this is how a lot of small firms get get launched: is moonlighting. Tell me about that. They were aware of it. 
Okay. Um, Good for because, you. Um, I had shared it with them that since they cut my salary, I need to st- figure out ways to um, subsidize my income. Babies um, need so diapers. Was, oh, was, you didn't have was, kids at that time. I didn't, I didn't have children, but you know, the, okay. I was working at a firm where they cut salaries to keep everyone aboard. Um, so I had shared with them, look, um, there are projects that I take on that from time to time I'm going to be working on after hours. Um, is it okay? And you know, they were, they were okay with it because it's, you know, architecture is one of these weird professions where we give it a term moonlight, but everyone sort of does it. You know, it's everyone sort of has this time period where they're sort of doing some sort of drafting for someone else or for some other architect. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of how you come, you know, get your experience, you know, on your own, figuring out, um, do you have a computer? You know, do you have a system for creating drawings for someone else outside of the office that you're working in on a nine to five. And what is that system? You know, I was, I had no children, so I was available to work um, after hours. I was younger. So working through the night wasn't a big deal. I I would rather do that than party. Um, So, you know, those things were different, different then. Um, I didn't have children as you shared. Um, So getting in a little earlier, two to three hours earlier in the morning to sort of finish up some drawings for someone before you start your regular nine to five was achievable and doable. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I openly communicated with them that, yeah, I was doing some, some, some moonlighting. I don't know if they knew how much I was doing sure. um, to the extent. And did, did they times, allow you to do it on their computers or did you just do it and didn't ask any questions or how did that work? I just did it and didn't ask any questions. Honestly, I did. Some of the work was done on my own personal computers. Um, there were probably times where I did some, you know, printing maybe on one of their computers. But, you know, I tried to respect the boundaries and the reality of it. You know, I, I understood the value of um, their own their machines and their paper and what they paid for. So, you know, yeah. I didn't really do too much intermingling between the two. I wasn't putting work stuff, my own personal stuff on their server or anything like that. I wasn't doing, yeah. you know, I was keeping it sort of, this is my work. I work on it at home. Or if I need to come in a little early to finish up something, I would. Um, but I gave them all I had. Yeah, beautiful. And this is interesting because it, moonlighting, as you call it, maybe it's not the best term for it, but it is something that is prevalent. I know that I did it uh, with the blessing of my employers, and uh, it was very, very helpful for me at the time to supplement my income with this moonlighting. Do you think that that needs to happen in the architecture industry, or is there another model? Do you think that people are doing this because they're not engaged with their jobs? Why do you think we have such a prevalent because I know my attorney friends, they're not moonlighting. I can tell you that for sure. My doctor <laughs> friends, they're not moonlighting. Can you imagine? You want to get your teeth worked on? Ibrahim, dude, um, on my off hours, I have a back office right, in my man, room. Come. Let's go do a little medical procedure. <laughs> yeah, come by after six. I come by Use after the side six. side door. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't imagine it. Um, I don't know. It's Architecture is one of these, you know, as you know, we're underpaid. You know, I, I feel like architects... For the you know it's again lack of education people don't value what they don't really understand so in the world they understand doctors help people but if architects rebranded it their purpose back to yes we can help people too because we really do i think people understand the importance of what architecture brings to the world um, but because architects sort of are this like hidden profession you know all these buildings in the world no one sort of sprays their hand and says Hi, I did all, I'm the architect behind this, or I'm the engineer behind all of these things. There really is an understanding of, you know, in terms of pay scale or uh, appreciation. And I say that not only in the economical, but in just, a, you know, people understand what lawyers do and how they're important in their role is and how they understand law. You know, architects are like lawyers and doctors of buildings because we have to understand the zoning context, the building code, which is not written by architects and lawyers. It's written by lawyers, as we all know. And again, understanding the microcosms and the inner workings of buildings and how they're just basically organisms. Um, and I think that if we graduate to the understanding on a global scale, of specifically I'll speak of the United States, within the United States that architects have an important role in the welfare and the health of all of our people, then there's a broader understanding of the role is way more important so that the, the fees are no longer a challenge. You know, it's So because of that, I think architects junior architects, this sort of profession in itself, um, it sort of gets this stain, for lack of a better term, where this is permitted because we are trying to achieve the cost implications back to capital. 
The only reason why I think that people were hiring me to moonlight or to do drafting is because they had costs that they couldn't get from other places. You know, it was cheaper to use me in these scenarios than it was to sort of do other things that might have been conventional than it wasn't. You know, when a doctor goes to school or gets their, uh, their, their, does their residency, they're paid a salary. Now, that salary isn't the same as a doctor's, but it's not sort of comparable to what you would do a junior architect or a paralegal. You know, yeah. it's, it's different. Um, why, why would so you say, what do you think, think the reason is, Ibrahim, that, that salaries or pay for architects is where it's at? What do you think are, what are the reasons for that? Why aren't architects compensated <clears throat> as well or better than attorneys or doctors, from your view, in the profession? Again, it's just people don't know what architects do. Um, yeah. So if you don't know what they do, you can't really put value to it. You know, so it's, someone could you find that a, people don't necessarily value, see the value in what exactly. you're bringing to the table as an architect. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. not uncommon. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, they don't, again, and it comes back to this sort of idea that you hire an architect to design a building, but you pay the contractor millions more to, to construct it, mm. and all the, all the architect did in their eyes is give them blueprints. You know, it's there's way more intricate, intricate than that. It's beyond just blueprints. It's It's... You know, coordination of drawings to make sure all of them are working together, making sure that there's no, there aren't any fires, that the materials selected are um, the proper materials that can work together, um, making sure that the light fixtures are at a certain height so that the design aesthetic can be met. Um, there's so many other parts of, of, of what architects do that is forgotten because we, 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 we aren't available, I think, to share it with the general public to... Um, talk about it. You know, I ask you, I'm, I'm outside of yourself. Um, you know, we're architects itself. We're in sort of like this different group. How many other architects did you sort of meet before the age of 21? Oh, I mean, just in school. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, in school, that was all I saw. And then to get out of school and, you know, and the AI mixer occasionally. Uh, exactly. <laughs> And that's what I mean. You, you, you meet lawyers, you meet doctors, you meet police officers, you meet all these other professions before certain ages, but architects are not really available to the public. And whether it's just career days or, yeah. you know, talking to people about what we do, it's like this, this job that not many people understand the role. So I constantly have to explain to people, no, you hire me before you hire the contractor. You know, it's, they don't yeah. understand the order at which yeah. they sort of come together. And I know um, you have a really good answer, really good way of explaining the value that you bring to a project. Do you mind sharing how you have that conversation with people? How do you present that? You know, it's, it's, it's a conversation of understanding that we try to build buildings that are healthy um, and buildings that heal. Uh, so it's whether you want to or not, uh, we engage in designing buildings that go beyond the code requirements, specifically energy related. Um, that go beyond the requirements of that. And that's incorporated into our building as into our designs as an ethos within our practice. Um, so a lot of these things are, not only are they energy efficient, but they provide outdoor access. Um, you know, it's whether it's, or they uh, provide access to an opportunity to grow fresh food on that lot or on that property. Um, so it's, as long as we believe we have these conversations up front and we engage uh, these conversations um, it's a different understanding further along in the design project because it's not a surprise when we're like, so the, the green space we agreed to put on the roof, um, but what green space? It's, no, it's the green space we decided to incorporate into the project from the beginning that I shared with you as part of the project um, and we believe will provide you with um, additional income or uh, um, added value to the project. Um, we need to discuss X, Y, Z. Um, it's, again, just... Keeping that same conversation from the upfront allows for no surprises and no hiccups. Um, keeping meeting minutes. Um, I've started to do meeting agendas and meeting minutes um, with individual clients, not only on certain projects, but now some clients may not remember they agreed to um, certain things. So now it's, we could agree that, you know, on March 12th, you agreed to do X, Y, Z uh, according to the meeting minutes. It was recorded here. And it sort of puts the onus on them to sort of stay engaged in the project, remind them that, okay, they agreed to this and it's going to be something that's going to be beneficial to the building. Um, all those things, again, are just things that we've incorporated into the practice over the last several years and we've learned have allowed us to create, uh, again, better products because these plans and these designs are 
products that we want end users to be happy with so that they can share with friends and family the work that we've done and um, go on to build cities because that's the true vision, build healthy cities. Mm. So Ibrahim, you came to a point in your career, let's when you're working for that firm and you, you realized there was something inside you that said, hey, look, this is no longer in alignment with my values. You gave the stories very touching about going to one of the, the prisons that they had designed, seeing mm-hmm. the incarcerated black and brown faces, and you said, you know what, I just can't do this anymore. What gave you the certainty to be able to walk from a job, which is very comfortable, right? <laughs> so this, this is the challenge. Is like at times in our life, we're called to make a move that puts us at risk, that puts us on the line. And what was it that had you have that self-belief? Did you grow up with your mother or your father telling you, Ibrahim, you can do this? Where do you think you got that seed of knowing that you could do that? Or was it just pure craziness? You're like, man, caution to the wind. We're going to do this. What was it? My mom advised against it. Oh, there we go. Your mom's like, nope, stay with the job. She said, it's not a good time to go start a business. And in my head, I said, how bad could it be? It's the worst time in economical history. It can't get any worse than this. Yeah. What did I have to lose? Yep. Yep. Um, so what was it? What was it? Do you think that provided that kernel of belief within you as a person? Maybe from your childhood, uh, or 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 from the way you no, approach I, life that caused you, you to know, think, you know what, I got this. In, you know, Enoch, it was the reality of watching the system. You know, this, the system of which we operate in, uh, specifically white supremacy, which re- which really did put the spotlight on it. Here I was six months ago fighting to get a door on a school for a thousand dollars and the the next conversation the following week was we don't care what the budget is for the prison that we need to build that conversation really did hit hard and hit home for me because it was no longer about health and wellness or education it's about just dollars and bottom line for whatever it is to, to incarcerate people um that's the honest truth of what it is you know and it's I'm not knocking other architects who that's their bread and butter who design jails. Um, but it just wasn't something that I could have participated in and been a part of any no longer. Yeah, um, I did I it, it twice and it was watching the, the, the conditions that these people were being forced to live in um, was not something that I saw being fixed, especially since I was seeing similar conditions being experienced by these same schools, which are operated by the same city. And I couldn't get the same amount of attention that they were getting for these jails in some of these scenarios. Okay. Um, yeah. That's the sort of straw that broke my back. It was, you know, it was, do you really want to be doing this? You know, I, going through, if you've ever taken a ride to a jail or to Rikers specifically, you know, you got to go to the sand pit where you got to get on this bus that the public bus, which takes you across the bridge um, to Rikers Island. And um, they tell you when you get to the, the check-in, don't lose this badge because then you won't be able to leave the island. And, um, you know, taking that tour was really eye-opening. I did it again at a Manhattan jail, which is MDC, which is what they call on Law and Order, the Tombs. Um, it's a real place. <laughs> you had a name. The language is even probably the Tombs. Um, and here are, here are these buildings that are in, you know, on the border of Chinatown in New York City. And until you really look at the building, do you realize that it's a jail? Because the bars are not on the outside, they're on the inside. And on the outside, they have windows. Um, and then when you really stare at it and you go into this building and you start to see some of these conditions and you, you know, you start to say, man, these people are human too. It's not cool. You know, and there's, there's really no consideration for these people in their conditions or how cold it is. It's, we need more beds. Um, what about the people who are here already? Um, you know, they have complained about mold and, you know, moisture infiltration and lack of adequate heating and, you know, broken windows or, um, leaks. And, you know, I've seen this through multiple different industries within the city of doing city work, um, that have really opened my eye and have pushed me to do my best to sort of repair it. And, um, it's sometimes it's tough. Um, you know, you got to seek solace in some of the work that you do and try to talk to people and really feel like you're making a difference. Um, but you know, as an op, as an architect, I think we're hopeless optimistics. You know, we believe that the work we're doing is, um, 
beneficial. You know, we last year I, I wrote on the wall and I was talking to my team. Um, we had 33 million homes short in terms of, you know, unhoused the homelessness problem in America. And I said, and I put the numbers to them and I said, even if we did a hundred houses designed a year for the next 10 years, that's only 10,000. That's not even going to make a, bu- a bubble in that number. And that doesn't include inflation and number of people who are going to be homeless on house for the years to come. Um, and then lo and behold, through the power of, I guess, manifestation, um, you know, power of, 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 of positivity or whatever have you, um, we've been getting projects for shelters to help design spaces that help these people. And, um, excuse me, creating those spaces have really been, um, they feel good. You know, you feel like you're doing something positive. You feel like you're doing something that's beneficial and you're doing work with an organization that really is trying to help and isn't really caring about making money. It's really just about trying to get people off the streets because everyone deserves a home. Yeah. Amazing. And there's the straw, straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. So you got to a point where it just, it was the pain, the pain of, living unaligned or continue to do that kind of work you know you, you couldn't survive there you couldn't continue to exist there you had to do something else mm-hmm. yeah yeah you broke out it's the reality of it. started your practice went for a few years it was a challenge it was a struggle fear got the best of you took a job employment with another practice again cycle exactly two months two months two months there you, this two lasted months, two months the first time job. well we got a you. job i mean and then this January of that year, I uh, got. I decided it was time for me to quit and got the guts. And my phone kept ringing. People kept calling. And I was like, what are you doing, man? Your phone's ringing. Clearly, you have a value to people that people want. You know, you, you're stepping out the office every 15 minutes, 20 minutes to take a phone call because I had jobs in construction. I had the jobs in various points of design, um, you know, jobs that I was providing different types of services for and you know my phone was ringing and I had to really just bet on myself and realize I'm providing the same types of services for other people without the comfort of having um, someone signing drawings or anything else uh, or providing oversight but you can do it so um, once I bet on myself that was it and I've continued to bet on myself since and I've been pretty good at it (laughs) beautiful beautiful so what would you say have been the three top principles looking back at the time that you spent growing to practice you've done it for a decade now what are the top three principles that you look back and you said those are principles of success these are things that i've seen repeated again and again that lead to things working around here number one i am unabashed and and i'm unafraid to ask for help i ask for help anywhere i can if it's my wife that i need help with if it's another architect if it's um, people in the group, other architects in a group, you know, you got a group chat, I'd reach out to them for help. Um, that's number one. Um, you know, the, the old analogy, closed mouth doesn't get fed. Um, I speak that analogy to truth. So I've constantly, um, asked for help. And number two, I would say, um, I tell people what's going on. Um, you know, people ask what's going on. I tell them, you know, uh, working on a book or, um, I've been doing a couple of these lectures or we're working on some of these really great projects in my office. Um, the power of sharing what's going on within, you know, your own life and the psychosis of which we operate in every day um, allows people in some of these con- con- scenarios to help. Um, one of the ways that I was able to acquire that contract with, this, with, with providing homes and shelters is um, I was actually at the park with my girls playing and I was complaining about some contract that I didn't get, <laughs> another woman overheard me and she gave me a card and she said, call me. I called her and lo and behold, she's a senior mem- uh, a partner at some company and she was able to provide me with, with some of the work that I required that I wanted to do. Um, you know, it's that. Um, and then just following up, man, keeping your word, like I said. Uh, you know, there are a lot of times I got a contract just because I told someone I was going to get a contract to them by Friday and I gave it to them by Friday just because I kept my word. <laughs> Those three things, just showing up, um, are way more important, I realized, than a lot of other things because a lot of people just don't show up for whatever reasons. They get scared or, you know, they create reasons or 
whatever it is. Um, those are sort of the three powerful things that I think every business owner should um, embrace, you know, asking for help, share with people what's going on in your business, let them know that you're looking for funding before you realize it. Such and such, such a person just got money from some company that you've never heard about. They're giving out money. You know, it's, you know, all those, all of that has happened to me in the last few years. You know, it's, I got a text message from someone, PayPal's giving out money. Before I know it, PayPal says, I want a grant. Um, I didn't know about it, but because people understood that, you know, I was looking for grant money to start some sort of program or whatever have you, um, they were able to share that with me. And, um, you know, li- looking for help, you know, it's the architecture is very collaborative. Um, and I've embraced the collaboration parts of architecture. So it's, um, we work with designers and renderers and architects and consultants and um, different types of engineers and landscape architects and all these different sort of people who play a different role within the spectrum of the built environment um, all have a role and all have something they can give you uh, or provide you. Um, so how is that going to sort of relate into your, your practice? Uh, depends on you. But um, if you're available and you're a friend, people are more keen to sort of work with you. And I think that's been my benefit. Mm. <clears throat> We have a magic wand. Where's Bo go from here? Dreamer. Let's let's what's the big vision here? Uh designing cities. Um we would love to really just design cities. Um, you know, healthy cities as we um take on what that looks like as I shared before. Um at my wedding, uh I made a a, a value. We didn't have vows, but we made a value that we a principle that we um promised the community at our wedding, which is I was gonna revolutionize affordable housing. So we're on that way and we're on that path. So whether it's gonna be the design of looking at how we design new cities, uh, new typologies, uh, that's to be determined before we're on our way. Beautiful. I love it. Ibrahim, well, thank you for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast and sharing your incredible story. Thank you, Enoch. Appreciate you and thank you for having me. It's been great. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.